Good morning, everybody. Uh, I have the enviable task this morning of having a chance to talk about the Federation's history and, and by extension, actually, talking a little bit about the development of our medical regulatory system in this country. Uh, so if you will indulge me for a half hour, I'm going to take you through this, what I think is a very visual journey. And I would start this way. Shakespeare, to paraphrase him, once said that the past is prologue. And those words are inscribed in the National Archives in Washington, D.C., which is, I think, an appropriate gateway into some of the comments I'd like to share with you. Because in order to really appreciate the role that the Federation has played over the past century, I think it's necessary to have a little bit of context for how our system itself for medical regulation has evolved over time. And I would start this way. It was uh, essentially all the way back to the colonial era that we attempted to regulate the practice of medicine. And in doing so, oftentimes we worked through medical societies, precursors of state medical boards in a very fundamental fashion. What happened at that time, around the late 1700s, early 1800s, is we also had what might have been termed sort of the heroic age of medicine, in which physicians, despite some of the very significant limitations in knowledge at that point, were really taking heroic measures to treat patients. Unfortunately, much of those heroic measures uh, were often harsher than the illness that many patients were uh, enduring. And so you had treatments that included blistering and purging, sweating, caustic uh, chemicals, frankly, being used. And there was at one point a sort of a movement away, a rejection from that type of medicine. And you can see that with uh, the pages of this book that I've got at the frontest page shown here. This individual, Samuel Thompson, essentially took uh, medicine to a more of a botanical and uh, herbalist approach, advocating that, in essence, every patient could be, in some element, his own physician. Well, whether right or wrong, what this represented was a sort of a rejection of how medicine was being practiced and how it was being regulated in that this was the first of several alternative philosophies of medicine that began to arise during this time period. This physiomedicalism that directly came from Mr. Thompson, the eclectic approach, a homeopathic medicine, and much later in the century, osteopathic medicine. What's important about this is this was in some ways a sort of democratic, egalitarian approach to how medicine might be uh, applied and somehow the way it would be regulated would be somewhat that same way. What happened was that there was a perception that any attempt to regulate medicine really was an exercise in protecting the privileged. And so you began to see, beginning in the 1830s in particular, an outright rejection of licensing laws that simply disappeared from the books. Now, this remained the norm for the better part of several decades. And it was only after Civil War that we saw really a sort of a rebirth in licensing laws. What's really important, and North Carolina is a good example of this, uh, in 1859 when they reestablished their medical board, was that there was an approach to uh, how the boards are actually composed, which tried to reflect some of those alternative philosophies. So you saw many states actually using separate boards. One might be to regular quote, or to regulate rather, regular physicians, others for homeopathic physicians. So you had a homeopathic board or an eclectic board or they would try to do representation actually with on one board itself, representing the different philosophies of medicine. Well, this approach was probably best used by the Illinois Board of Health, which was the precursor of the medical board in that state. Uh, Dr. John Rauch was very instrumental with that board, and much of what that board did really became an exemplar for the kind of roles that state medical boards could play. This board very clearly set minimum standards for licensure. They examined prospective candidates for licensure in their state. They prepared, prepared very carefully annual reports with their findings in terms of performance on their licensing examinations and assessments of the actual schools from which these individuals were coming that included approved, a list of approved, excuse me, approved schools. One other thing is very relevant, I think, here. And I've highlighted a couple of key words because of these various approaches to the practice of medicine at this time. They literally had individual board members who would examine within specific fields. So you can see that Dr. Gott at the top there was going to examine any prospective candidate who had gone through a homeopathic training. And the same for physiomedical and eclectic. 
The other thing that is very interesting about this particular board is that several of those individuals became very key players in one of the first attempts to establish national organizations around uh, medical regulation. These were the two predecessor organizations that actually Dr. Melnick alluded to in his uh, comments this morning when he presented the gift portrait to us. The Federation's two predecessor organizations were the National Confederation and the American Confederation, and I will forbear going through those very long titles themselves. But what's important about these two is that they were, in some ways, offering complementary missions but somewhat uh, different approaches. The National Confederation very clearly said that the most important thing to be doing at that time was to essentially emphasize increasing the standards for medical education, and consequently, you can elevate the standards for licensure. Makes sense. But it's playing to a very long-term kind of end game. The American Confederation actually resulted in 1902 almost as a schism within the National Confederation because the American Confederation resulted from the fact that there were individuals who had been active within the National Confederation and felt that while this was laudable, the goals to increase standards for education and for licensure per se, that there were very immediately pressing issues that needed to be tended to, and specifically what they were looking at was license portability, reciprocity agreements to be very precise. What finally happened ultimately was that there was a special committee formed within the National Confederation that was going to address this issue that some members had brought forward. When the committee report is brought back to the National Confederation, uh, essentially the committee was thanked for their efforts, discharged, and the report was filed. It so infuriated some of these members who felt that this was giving short shrift to a very important and timely issue in terms of reciprocity agreements and how they could facilitate license portability that in essence it created this second confederation. And so these two organizations went about their business separately for the better part of 10 years. Uh, there were periodic attempts to uh, bring the two together, and you can see up here is a, a newspaper article from the St. Louis newspaper that talked about a conference that was held, but unfortunately unable to bridge the uh, disagreements between the two. Both organizations were doing laudable work. Both had very limited resources. Both were beginning to become, in some ways, victimized by perceptions about their role. One of the things that dogged the National Confederation was that, well, there was a strong perception that they were, in some ways, an extension of the American Medical Association, in part because there were several leaders within the National Confederation which held prominent positions within the AMA. The perception that took hold of the American Confederation, however, was a little bit different, which was that it was the organization that was a little more uh, friendly, if you will, to individuals who had gone through other philosophical uh, trainings in medicine, the homeopathic school and the eclectic school. Well, everyone recognized this is really not the best way for this system to continue. And so ultimately, there was a nice push that came from our friends within the AMA and the AAMC. And you can see a direct quote that is kind of a gentle chiding that you gentlemen really need to get together and try to organize one body that would bring together all of the states. Well, and that is indeed what happened. Um, the presentation this morning of the, the gift portrait really uh, memorializes that uh, significant meeting that took place technically February 25th, uh, 1911. And, and what occurred on that exact date was the agreement between the two organizations that yes, we will merge. There was much work to be done in terms of like, putting together some uh, an appropriate constitution and bylaws, but the fundamental agreement to merge took place that day and was captured in this portrait. And in many ways, it was brokered as a, as a negotiation with a lot of assistance from the organizations that were mentioned earlier today. I think it's appropriate to give credit to the pioneering boards, and there were approximately 22 original charter member boards to the Federation in 1913. What to me is most fascinating about this group is when you look at the original constitution and bylaws for the Federation, it's clear that the Federation was willing to forego rapid expansion in order to achieve some very distinct goals. Because when you read the extant uh, correspondence then and look at the original bylaws, membership derived on a voluntary basis, not from simply being a state medical board, but instead a state medical board with certain minimum standards that were not only on the books, but were being enforced. 
So it was really a voluntary association that was really looking with an eye to the long term to get those standards in place and work with a small cadre of boards that were willing to start small and just keep moving from there. We were very fortunate in the early days of the Federation with some of the leadership that we had possessed. I would mention just a couple of people, Dr. Charles Cook from Massachusetts, for example. He led a contingent of National Confederation leadership uh, into the new Federation's roles. And what was most important about Dr. Cook was his philosophical approach. I remember reading a letter that he had written in 1911 and already looking at what the Federation needs to be doing. And he made it very clear that we needed to mix pragmatism with aspiration. And always remember that in many ways, while the ideal is what we strive for, the adequate is never the enemy of the ideal. And so he really championed the cause of being realistic in what we could achieve both individually and collectively, whether it was with licensing examinations, license portability, whatever the topic may be. Dr. Strickler carried on the work through 1925, and the great takeaway that I derive from Dr. Strickler when I look at his work and some of his writings, he was a self-described sectarian physician. After going through a homeopathic medical school, he was very attuned to the fact that there was so much tension within the profession, some of it very clearly manifested in how medical boards were constituted with separate boards for regular medicine, homeopathic, et cetera, and that was in 15 different states or clearly trying to represent the various philosophies of medicine with on a board. He was uh, very clear that he felt that more should be done to try to bring, essentially, the profession together and to try to begin to minimize those lines of division that really were plaguing uh, a more of a unified approach to how the profession was being regulated or overseen. Dr. Baring was mentioned this morning by Dr. Benjamin, and she gave him appropriate credit, and, and I would simply echo that. Dr. Walter Baring of Iowa was probably the single most important figure in the early history of the Federation. Dr. Baring was critical because for many years when we had no permanent uh, offices or paid staff, he was the Federation. So in the first couple of decades of the Federation, you had this tremendous kind of activity that was taking place. Uh, the Federation was trying to serve as an advocate on behalf of state medical boards. And one of the things that's most interesting is to look at the Federation's work to assist the boards with their examinations. To, today, it's quite interesting. If you use the term medical examiner, people immediately think, okay, CSI, forensics. And if you're of a certain age, we remember Jack Klugman as Quincy, right? There was no confusion about the term medical examiner, though, a century ago. When you said medical examiner, they knew you were talking about someone who was a member of a state medical board whose primary role and function was to examine or assess the qualifications of a candidate for licensure. That was clearly understood. And the states, and the state boards, rather, had been making tremendous uh, progress so that by 1907, all states were mandating a licensing examination and by a decade later, not simply an examination of cognitive knowledge, but there were practical components to the examinations in 16 states. And this included everything from laboratory work as a part of the examination to in interacting with real patients. It's also important to note that the Federation, I think, strongly championed the cause of the National Board of Medical Examiners at its founding in 1915. Dr. Rodman, who founded the National Board, had a clear vision to what he th thought would be one of the great solutions to this portability issue. He strongly believed that it was a single examination that was being taken, regardless of the jurisdiction somebody might present themselves for licensure, it would be the great tool to sort of level the field. The Federation, uh, when you look at the bulletin of information, or bulletin rather from those days, and uh, the comments coming from people like Herbert Harlan in Maryland or John Baldy in Pennsylvania. They strongly championed the cause in, of the National Board and its establishment, and in some cases even said just outright, it doesn't matter what anybody else does. In my state, we're going to go ahead and recognize this examination. The Federation also was trying to assist boards with discipline, and I, I guess this is a nice adjunct to Dr. Agrawal's comments about fraud. The Federation's greatest contribution in this area, particularly in the 1920s, was our publication, the Federation Bulletin that dates back under various names all the way to 1913. And what you would find if you look in the pages of the Bulletin from those days many times was reporting on 
news in terms of news items that uh, reflected actions taken by member boards, criminal convictions, and so on. And we had illustrative case studies, an example of which you see up here. Uh, Mr. Charles Pinkham, uh, the, the physician who led the California board for many years, was really one of the great uh, advocates for the board's disciplinary role. And he wrote extensively on uh, mechanisms by which the boards could uncover and detect fakes, frauds, imposters trying to set for someone else on a licensing exam. Did a wonderful job bringing all this forward, much of it in the pages of the Federation's bulletin. We would have been best served, of course, by a central bureau, but unfortunately that was simply not something the Federation could take on at that time. It had to wait. But one other note that I would add at this point about state boards and discipline in those days, the vision for discipline, unfortunately, was fairly narrow. It was looked at as really more of an exclusionary function, to exclude those who were unlicensed or those who might be imposters from the practice. So it took a very narrow view of their role in that sense. The greatest contribution of state medical boards in the Federation in the 1920s, though, may have been in the area of medical education. Uh, we're all familiar with the educational reforms of Flexner and prior to that, some of the more progressive medical schools in the late 19th century, the Johns Hopkins, the Harvards, the Michigans. But it was really the state medical boards whose greatest contribution uh, during this time period dealt with the proprietary medical schools, those for-profit schools. Those were the schools that in some cases, or I should say in most cases, had neither the means nor the willingness to meet the kind of standards that were being imposed at this time. And so consequently, the boards were doing a lot of work to try and eliminate these proprietary schools. Sometimes it was a hit or miss affair. You can see that there was a very well-known instance in the 1920s, mid-1920s, involving a particular school in Missouri that was ostensibly little more than a diploma mill that had some significant repercussions for several state medical boards, in fact. As I did the research along with Dr. Chowdhury for the Federation history, one of the things that struck me is when you look at the long history, there are occasionally lulls. I don't think any organization that exists for a century can have this straight, linear line always ever upward in terms of progress and achievement. And the Federation uh, had its period of a lull during the 1930s and 40s for a number of reasons. But what that really did is set the stage for a resurgence in the 1950s. And this is where the Federation had several great achievements. One area, the first of these, which was quite unexpected, was our ability to get through an Essentials of a, Medi a Modern Medical Practice Act. And this was a very unlikely area simply because this had been attempted 50 years earlier with little to show for it. One of the things I found most intriguing, though, is that the special committee that did this work said that even though there was so much variation in the statutory language between the states, most of it was being masked by the very capable administration of the boards themselves, so that they were able to do, sometimes without the statutory purview, what needed to be done, really, to regulate the practice of medicine. A second major accomplishment in the 50s was our uh, participation in evaluating IMG preparedness. The Federation, in some of its activities and roles, including with some member boards seen in 1949, Illinois, Minnesota, New York, and Wisconsin, really played an integral part in trying to, through several iterations of committees, begin to move the concept of assessment for international graduates away from a school approach, where you're looking at an institution, as opposed to looking at the individual themselves. And here we, where we were inspired in part by the Michigan Medical Board, who had this in, uh, rather unique system of an oral screening board for internationally trained graduates, who essentially came in, had an oral examination through basic and clinical sciences, and if they were deemed to have performed satisfactorily, they moved into a one-year internship in an approved hospital. If they were struggling at any point, there were uh, mandatory English language courses if that was one of the sources of the issue. It was that approach, that individual look at a physician's preparedness that really is some of what you see then today in the certification processes of the ECFMG. A third area of this resurgence had to do with examination institutes. State medical boards, their reason for existence was that licensing examination in many ways, their role in examining and licensing physicians. 
we engaged in a major initiative at the Federation in the 1950s to try to bring together members from all state medical boards who were still writing the content, largely, for their own state's examinations and trying to get a greater uniformity in what was being assessed. Now, unfortunately, the Achilles heel within that approach tended to be the fact that they were still predicating this on essay-style examinations, which already by the late 50s were beginning to fall into disfavor from the, the science of assessment. The 1960s then really was the beginning of a significant change for the Federation. In 1962, we had our first permanent national offices here in Fort Worth, sustained in part by a gift from the AMA, which had a, an interesting caveat to it. The gift came with the caveat that the money would be used to establish not only that permanent national office, but to establish a central bureau, a board action data bank, so that there's a central repository for capturing all these actions taken by state medical boards. Well, this is important because in retrospect, you can see that one of the greatest challenges to medical boards as expectations had changed now in terms of their role and function, one of the greatest obstacles was really beginning to change the mindset for many of the boards themselves. Keep in mind that for many boards at this point, uh, their reason for existence was to examine a candidate for licensure and then to license them. Discipline was largely a purview of the profession through societies or associations. The state medical boards had to adopt a mindset that no, it is essentially our responsibility to be doing this. And the Federation helped with documents such as the guidebook on medical discipline you see here and the encouragement of strong leaders like Robert Derbyshire, who was published widely on disciplinary issues throughout much of the 60s, 70s, and even into the 1980s. The Federation tried to assist in this role as best we could. We did this in two ways. Number one, we helped to disseminate uh, the information itself. So whether it was in the early days, literally reporting on the actions taken by member boards in the pages of the Federation Bulletin, or later creating monthly reports that were disseminated, or in more recent years, what it sure seemed high tech at the time in the 1980s when we had those floppy disks that we were sending to the board so they could query directly with us. Seems pretty quaint to look at it now. Even more quaint though is right to the left. That is a snapshot from the, orig or the card catalog we still maintain there at the offices of board actions that were taken housed on index cards all the way back to the early 60s. The other big advancement in the 1960s for the Federation and the licensing community was the flex examination that was conceived in partnership with the National Board. Uh, this was uh, an initiative that really you need to give a great deal of credit to the medical boards for being willing to rethink their, one of their fundamental roles and functions. Um, we had eight pioneering boards that were willing to be a part of that first flex administration. And in fact, by 1973, all but two states were already recognizing and using the flex. So the, the era of the state developed examination was quickly coming to an end. And credit for that really goes to some of our members, people that served on that original flex committee, including Dr. Frederick Merchant, who was known affectionately as Mr. Flex, frankly. He was so closely associated with the flex examination over those years. The pace of change really just accelerated, though, for the Federation in the 1970s and 80s. One of the big changes that occurred was in 1973, we revised our bylaws to begin to accept as members independent osteopath, osteopathic boards. In the 1980s, we took another step towards true independence, if you will, in that we held for the first time a standalone annual meeting. And we were very nervous in doing that in 1982 because we weren't sure who's gonna show up. We'd been so used to all those years previously doing this in conjunction with the AMA in particular as a part of the annual Congress on Medical Licensure and Education. And you can see, I've got it there on the screen, a, the program from I think it was 1923. We, we were so surprised to have nearly 300 people show up and delighted. The pace of change continued with a notable first, Dr. Anthony Cortese, our first osteopathic physician to serve as the elected uh, federation chair. Dr. Susan Behrens is the first woman to serve as our elective chair. And this is a little later in the 1990s, but uh, Susan Behrens as the first uh, public member to serve as the elective chair of the Federation. It's really though in the 1990s that the major growth in this organization took place that really brought about the, the organization that most of you recognize today with the kinds of services that are most synonymous with us, the USMLE, 
the FCBS, our Credentials Verification Service the collaborative inter, uh, international efforts with IAMRA, and so much of our policy work that really defined what we were doing at that time period. Very briefly on the USMLE, I would just touch on this, uh, because I, tomorrow there is a great session on uh, the comprehensive review of USMLE that will spell out a little more detail, but we had a tremendous uh, collegial relationship with our colleagues at the National Board that dates back to the founding of this and even precedes it to the establishment of the flex examination itself. You see here the joint meeting of the respective boards from 1990 who are blessing in essence that document or the task force that recommended a single pathway that really very successfully has gone on to more than one and a half million test administrations and at the same time done an excellent job I think in maintaining direct participation from our member boards as a part of the US assembly process. One other thing I would note in terms of the expectations that changed for the Federation, there were certainly heightened expectations I think we've seen in this past decade. And I tried to bring special attention to that one word in this document. This is a medical license from 1931 in the state of Tennessee. Uh, and you'll notice it says a certificate of permanent license. I guess what's uh, unusual there is that the, ten the state of Tennessee made explicit what was largely implicit to our licensing process which was once you got the license, you were going to keep that license, barring something catastrophic, if you will. Well, what we've seen clearly is in a continuation of these expectations that are placed not only upon the medical profession, but the state medical board community to ensure continuing competence. So whether we want to go back to New Mexico's role as the first board to mandate CME as a condition of relicensure, whether we want to point to the historic uh, resolution adopted in this House of Delegates in 2004, the maintenance or the maintenance of licensure pilots that we'll be talking about at this meeting. There's been tremendous work in that area. And finally, I would just give a call out to several important leaders over the years. We've been very fortunate with our senior staff, from Brock, Dr. Brian Galusha all the way to Dr. Hank Chowdhury. These individuals have been articulate spokesmen for the organization. They've been key architects in the Federation as it's come into being today. And we have really achieved much through the assistance of people like this. Finally, if you find this kind of thing intriguing, and I, I hope you do, you'll be able to read more about this. We have a publication, a uh, history of the Federation, Medical Licensing and Discipline America, a history of the Federation of State Medical Boards set for publication this August uh, by Dr. Chowdhury and myself. I think you will find it informative not only in the history of this organization, but really about our entire regulatory system and how it evolved. Dr. Chowdhury, I think we'll turn things back to you.